Yes, today we're joined by Glenn's Vodka Premiership Manager of the Month for August, Stephen Robinson. What a legend. How are you, my friend? All right? Good, good. Aye. Brought the sun with you anyway. Unbelievable. Oh, you're wearing big two of you, big What the fuck are we doing? What's going wrong here? I've got thinking? a pair of ski pants on here and everything. <laughs> By the way, you're in good neck, aren't you? <laughs> oh, it's looking better with this tight stuff. Mate, you are it. Did you join in? <laughs> no, those days are gone. You're joking. Are you, are you no, I'm 48 now. No, but you're a player, mate, weren't you? I, I'm still robbing, still trying to keep yourself right in the gym. I keep yourself seeing. I'm still at my playing weight, actually. I'm are still, you, I'm still at the same weight I played, I. Uh, How have you managed that? I actually think I'm in better shape now than when I played. I the, the, the penny dropped, I think, after I finished playing. I need <laughs> to get fitter here. <laughs> Were you a big one for looking after yourself when you played? No, I did, I. Because I wasn't the most talented player in the world. So you had to... I, listen, I run about and kick people and scored goals. So that was the, the makeup of my game. So yeah. you had to be fit. So I always tried to look after myself. I had a lot of injuries and bits. So you end up getting more into your body than than probably most because you were in the gym that much. So yeah. I had to look after myself. I played with Dermot O'Carroll at Celtic as a kid. How is it? Honking he was. Was it? Uh, Honking. <laughs> my bad, that, doing that. That's me being generous. See, now, he tells me he was a really good player in them days, but didn't realise he was a good runner. And now he's a really good runner. Uh, he couldn't run, mate. He couldn't run as a kid. I find he that had a 45-year-old body, mate, at 18. Uh, really? Uh -huh. I find that incredible, because see, now he's the fittest boy around. Is he? Honestly, really? he's the fittest boy around. You used to have done it the uh, wrong way, really. Right? Raw some ways, <laughs> I. <laughs> I've heard big things that you're a, you're a manager who loves to coach. Uh, uh, am I right in saying that you've got the least staff in the SPL as well? I well, we definitely did last year. Um, you know, we had a lot of financial problems, so we had to make a lot of cuts, and it was just me and Dermot. Dermot was doing the analysis at the same time, but we progressed this season. We've got a new anal analyst in. We've got a new under eighteen manager in as well. But um, I, st it's, I, I try and keep the staff relatively small anyway, because as you said, I do like to be on the pitch. Dermot's an excellent coach, you know, top class in terms of his detail as well. So we both get our hands dirty anyway and, and don't stand back. And we involve the, the two boys under 18 manager and academy manager, Alan McManus, as well. So yeah, it's a tight knit staff, but I'd like to believe decent. Yeah, decent. Uh, August. What a month, a few minutes away for be going top of the league. How do you reflect in the month? It's been a great start, I, from. From getting beat by Montrose in the first cup game of the season, I um, calling you for you to be sacked. Uh, I, I, I was getting a few shouts <laughs> from behind me. I leave our football club on that, so I, um, it turns around very quickly. But no, look, we 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 search for players and and how we hadn't quite got them in or got them up to speed at that stage as well. And listen, that's no excuse. You should still be beating Montrose, but. It's a banana skin, it's a hiding to nothing, them games on a sticky Astro pitch. So we managed to get another couple of weeks training in ourselves. You get a bit of momentum with the cup results and you know we started the league fantastically well and probably a wee bit disappointed we haven't got 10 points because our performance against Aberdeen merited three points and you know their penalty where Miosky kicks the ball twice as well. So perhaps we well, a wee bit of luck that could have went their way, we, we could add 10 points. Yeah. Are you a manager, I've been with managers before that work, work like kind of working blocks? Yeah. In terms of games, do you do that? Very much so, yeah. yeah, yeah very right. much so. so yeah. How many, what, what kind of, what, what does a block look like? How many games do you? So we've got it this season down in, with, uh, I think it's, well, it's blocks of four. So where you, we, we worked out you need five or between five and six points each block to try and get into the top six. Um, and what it does, you know, you go into games and um, some people say, but how do you, how can you justify working towards not winning games? And that's not the case. It's, you don't get too high and you don't get too low. You know, if you, you manage to get, so we manage to get eight points in this block. So we're ahead of where we're, our target is. Um, and then you'll have another block where you maybe get no points or two points and it balances itself out and you can justify it to the players not to get too low with things and, and not to get too high with things and just keep a, a level head and, and keep doing your work and, and working towards the ultimate goal, which is, First of all, to stay in the division, you know, the points needed to stay in the division and then, you know, obviously try and get into the, the top six again. So again, you obviously lost players in the summer. Did you still think it was a realistic thing that you could get top six again? Because it was such a massive achievement last year with a really good squad. Yeah, we. I think the hard bit is um, replicating that and, you know, when you, you the players that leave, you know, there's a lot of players left with yeah. real experience. Trevor Carson, Joe Shaughnessy, Richard Tate. Um, Decky and Gallagher. Decky as well, yeah. Tony Watt went back again, so... A lot of boys that I knew for a long time that carried the dressing room, but um, we brought younger boys in. We added a little bit more pace and energy to to what we already had, and there's always a fear, yeah, because you know people like Ram Flynn, Marcus Fraser, Alex Gogage, you know those players are are undervalued at what they do off the pitch as well, and you know it was always our goal, and we were patient. The hard bit was you're doing it on the you know relatively the same budget because 
we were a top six side, but you just suddenly don't, you're not a top six side in terms of finances or crowds or facilities, you know, but we managed to chip away at things to, to everybody else. You know, we put two new Lumi ice baths in, we got, you know, a better pitch at the training ground. We were able to upgrade certain things around the place and to everybody else is probably normal, but you know, we're chipping away, trying to make the club sustainable. Um, the board backed us to give it a transfer fee for the first time in, in history, I think. Um, and we were able to go and sign Conor McMenamin with that. So I believe we've, we've come out the window with a stronger squad and it's been tough, but we've, I feel we've got there. I think, I mean, we spoke to Martin down, it does seem very, I think certainly the recruitment and finances seems one of the biggest challenges for a, a manager in, in Scotland. How is sort of, how do you sort of go about the recruitment process here? I think that it's not, I know what I like, I like pace. Um, I always say to Martin, we, we have one scout, you know, we have, we have one scout in, in the whole country. Um, You've got one scout? One scout. We've got one person, Martin Foyle, who's been with me everywhere I go. He's been absolutely outstanding. Um, but the world's a smaller place now with all the technology. You know, we've, we've got bits and pieces of data that we get and skimp and scrape off different people. Um, we've got a lot of contacts yeah, in the game down south. I played for a long time. So, you know, you have a lot of people pick up the phone and probably establish themselves as a, as a coaching team that can develop players. So agents want their players to come here. They want to, to have the platform of Scottish football now as well. So it's getting bigger. I think the quality's improved. And yeah, that's, that helps the recruitment process. It doesn't make it any easier because you can't all of a sudden throw a lot of money at it. Um, and I think my first two years at Motherwell, all I talked about was the budget and bleeded on about it and bored the life out of everybody about it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Mrs. used to say to me, you shut up about your budget, will you please? <laughs> so I've learned now that fans don't want to hear that. You know, they just want you to do what you can. Everybody knows your budget's not brilliant and you try and do what you can with it. And we, we run with a small squad so that we can bring more quality into that. You know, we've got 19 outfield players. Um, and that's by choice as well. I could probably have a few more, but maybe not quite as much quality. But I believe every player in that 19 can add value to, to us winning football matches. So you say you're a manager, obviously, you do the coaching, recruitment as well. I'm intrigued to know, what does a typical day look like for Stephen Robinson as a um, manager? Well, up at six o'clock, walk the dog. We're Robin. Um, we do Bobby fight. Pickies, shut up there, because I uh, hate people that don't do that. I'll have to. I'll Good have man. to. No, no, I have to. There's, I'll be on the Stuart and Facebook page if I don't do that. <laughs> You're joking. No, we do that. I, um, and then get in here for around about half seven, go to the gym for an hour, get my head right. Um, and then we have a staff meeting around about quarter to nine, get out, set up, have our, the boys get their breakfast and all. They're, they're treated very well here as well, get their breakfast. And then we have a team meeting. Uh, quarter to 11. We train a little bit later to allow us a, a bit of time, allow the boys to take their kids to school. I think that's very important family time as well. Um, the, the boys train. We'll have um, you know, a session for a couple of hours, some individual stuff afterwards in, in units. Um, and they go into the gym, they do the gym every day. So it's a, it's a club that drives itself. It's a, a group of players that drive themselves. You know, they're, they're only compulsory to do the gym two days a week, but they're in there every morning. The young players report at half eight. They have an hour in the gym before anybody's in. Oh. Um, and we've just created a culture where people want to work. They want to be in and do extra. They want to get in and do their ice baths and look after themselves and, and, you know, give themselves the best opportunity of succeeding. So, We'll have a, a sort of debrief around about half one, two o'clock. And, and After then, every session, you'll have a debrief, yeah? Yeah, it's, I mean, me and Dermot will still be debriefing at seven o'clock at night through our voice notes as well. So <laughs> plan your session for the next day and and then probably around about four o'clock, you, you leave the club and go for another 5K with the dog again. So yeah. um, Non-stop. And, and try and stay fit at the same time. Do you sleep at night? I sleep brilliantly. Do you, mate? I, I've got my, it, no, I I've got my Fitbit. I got an 89 last night, so I was... So you got a 69 last night, 69 didn't you? Did you? <laughs> <laughs> That's <is> so <laughs> sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Stevie, so we, we need a debate. Uh, I was asking this question. <laughs> I'm three of them. I'm going to say it a wee bit. So we need a wee debate about sort of... It'd be great to see Scottish clubs sort of trying to get close to Celtic Rangers. Now, that is very difficult, as we spoke about the finan uh, finances here, but one team... Certainly last year, who, I mean, Celtic were unstoppable things, but you certainly gave Celtic a lot of hard games and seemed to have a right great idea of how to play against them. How did you come up with that against Celtic? I think we we done it against most teams. We we just what we what I found in the past is you always went to Celtic Park, you went to Ibrox, and you change what you do. So everything you'd worked on all throughout the season, you go oh right, let's scrap that for two games and let's try and do this here, and. 
I never really had any success with it, yeah. the truth be told. Well, you know, you were going to say here. You st stuck we we yeah. stuck to what we'd done. We just yeah. changed our line of engagement and we, we, you know, we started our patterns a little bit higher up the pitch. Celtic were the best pressing team outside ourselves. We were the second best pressing team in the SPL. Um, and instead of exposing ourselves, we tried to reduce where we pressed on the pitch. We tried to push them into wider areas and, and set triggers to press, you know, with three triggers. But they were our triggers for every team. So, for example, if we played, you know, a team that we thought we could press, they played out from the back. We could win the ball back. We pressed in the final third against Celtic. We pressed from the day of the halfway line. But the triggers were all the same. So they weren't re-educating the players just for this one-off game. And they went into the game really, really confident. You know, we had a real good preparation. We showed them lots of analysis each day. My analysis is, is only two minutes long because they've got the attention span of a pea to be fair. <laughs> so, you know, and we, we just built that every day. And, and obviously you get an early goal and it, it settles everybody down. And we just felt with the pace that we had and the energy we had in the forward areas, we could hit the, both of them teams on the counter attack. And especially against Celtic, it worked very, very well. And, we got beat heavily in a couple of the games, but we were, we were, the, the cup yeah, game, we were excellent. Yeah. We were really, really good. And you know, you look around and they bring maybe 20 million pounds worth of talent on. And even in the last game of the season, we played against Michael Bins Rangers and I think Michael's a top coach and I always like testing myself. And I thought, you know, tactically, we were brilliant. We lost three nil through individual errors. And you know, sometimes you can't control that. That just, it just happens. But tactically, the boys believe in what we're doing and, you know, credit to them. The staff can, can put stuff on. But they have to carry that out and they have to implement it on the pitch. And they, they did on numerous occasions. So it's a, a huge credit to them. I think a lot of managers come in, especially in Scotland, and try to implement their style straight away. It's this way or no way. Do you think when you maybe go in with no lesser players, but no top players, that you maybe need to suit what the players you've got as in system wise before you can then go into what you actually want to do in the long run yeah 100% everyone's got an ideal way everybody wants to play a pep let's be honest we all want to yeah. play like that but you can't um, and the reality is you need to get longevity in the in your career and if you go in with the idea you can only play one certain way you end up you inherit a team that can't play like that where maybe centre halves are not good at playing out from the back then you won't be in the game for very long you have to adapt you know, you don't need to change your principles because your principles can start in the day of the halfway line as opposed to your 18-yard box in terms of position. Um, and I think it's a learning curve for, for young people come into the game and young managers. You know, the mistake is it's, you know, I'll, I won't sacrifice my principles. I won't sacrifice my style of play. But ultimately, you probably won't manage a very long time if you don't hit the ground running. So that's, you know, things I've learned probably from Michael O'Neill. I learned that, you know, he had a style of play that he wanted to play. We inherited a Northern Ireland squad that, you know, not everybody could play like that. Um, and we found a way that worked and I thought, you know, that's the way forward. You know, if you need to play a style that suits what you, you have in the building. He's had an absolute incredible season, uh, last season. How do you top that this year? It's tough. It's, um, people always criticise me for saying, look, first and foremost, we need to stay in the division. But that, that is the reality for probably seven or eight of the clubs in the SPL. You need to first get the points that keep you safe and then build them up, you know, Inside our dressing, we've got aspirations of, of being better than that and not just surviving. But it's, um, it's difficult. You know, there's a lot of teams invested heavily. You'd expect five of the top six positions to be gone. Yeah. You know, if you look in terms of size of the club, mm -hmm. but football isn't always played on paper. On paper, they should be gone. But you know, you'll always have a team that surprises. We were the team last year. I believe we've retained a lot of the, the good things and good, good people that we had at the football club and give ourselves maybe a few more options in the forward areas, but you need a little bit of luck as well. You need, you know, injuries, uh, yeah, if, you know, if we get two injuries in any one position, which is the, the same as any club, you're going to struggle. You know, I hear Celtic have got a lot of injuries at the minute or, you know, Man United haven't got their foot squad. I think, flip, you know, come down to our world and, you know, you're maybe only, you're putting two 16 year olds on the bench that have never kicked a ball before. You know, every club's the same. If you get a runner, or for injuries, you'll struggle. And you have to hope that things go your way. You know, the last six games of the season we played with Curtis Main as our only centre forward because we had injuries and um, people playing with a little knock. So, you know, you, you just hope for the best. You hope that you get that. And I believe we've got a team, if we keep players fit, that we can really challenge at the obviously for the, the top six and, and maybe her. So third then, you're going to get third. <laughs> that in that's, a, um, <laughs> that's a big ask, that's a big ask. It is, it looks like it's up for grabs this year. Oh, 100%. Third, third, doesn't it? With the start, Aberdeen, Hibs and Hearts, do you look at that as well or do you t solely focus on yourselves? No, I think it's it's very early to be judging things, you know, in football, you know, people lose their job now after two games, you you don't get a chance to sort of build anything, you hear about young players, but it's actually a huge risk to develop young players now because you don't get the chance to, to develop them because young Does players... Does that frustrate you? Sorry, not... Yeah, because... 
you know, my background was like my, I worked with all the young players in Northern Ireland. That was how I started my coaching. So my background would probably be to push young players forward, but it's, it's difficult because you get a, a very limited amount of time and young players make mistakes, you know, and that's why we've got, I think we've got a good system here where, you know, we sell, send players out to the Irish League on loan, which is a really competitive league now. The good managers, you know, like, like David Healy and, you know, we've got boys at Ballymena, boys at Cliftonville with Jim Magilton and they're learning the game. And they're, with all respect, they're making mistakes in their first team as opposed to my first team. And you hope they come back more first team ready mm. rather than playing under 18 football, which we, we didn't have a development squad last year. We've now got development games. So, that, you know, it's, it's some going away, getting game ready, some staying in the building who I feel might come into the first team a little bit earlier. Um, but it is hard. It's getting harder to, to put your faith in them because as much as you like young players, you don't get the time to, to see them develop. There's a whisper that the wee centre midfielder who's went on Ireland's a top player. Five Fraser Taylor. Heard big yeah. things. Very good. Very good. One of, one of, pr probably one of the technically most gifted players I've worked with, yeah, which is well. is a good statement because I've been lucky enough to work with people like Steve Davis and um, Turnbull. And yeah, I've, I've had a lot of good players. So he's fantastic. He's very small. If he was in Spain, he would be a Xavi or any Esther. Um, that's where I wanted to get him on loan in Spain. I thought, <sighs> thought Barcelona might, might have come in for him to look at him, but he's got bigger, he's got stronger, he's a dedicated young boy, and we're just hoping that first team football really develops him. I'm fascinated by this year. When do you, I love asking ex players this when they begin to manage, when do you realise you want to become a manager? I didn't. So, see, <laughs> when you were playing in your career? I, I no real desire to, no. Um, I'm very insular off the pitch and very quiet away from the uh, football. You know, me and my partner literally walk our dog. As, as our life, we go out, we take our dog for a walk, we have a bottle of wine on Saturday night, we don't do very much. Um, red quite, white. Red, uh, red, very much yeah, red, yeah. Nice. Um, we're on the gins now, I think, with the sun out as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so being a manager wasn't top of my list, no. Um, as I said, I didn't get the, the coaching bug. I, I love being on the pitch. I, I love the tactical side of the game. Management's difficult. Um, very, very hard, but I think the more experienced you, you come in, you, Mark McGee was brilliant for me. Mark, you know, was, he was so experienced, a thousand games and gave me lots of good advice about man management and, you know, working under the managers that have, Michael O'Neill and David Moyes and all the international managers. You, you realise actually when you look back, you picked up a lot from them, um, subconsciously. I never really intended to. So I was, uh, I didn't actually set out to do this. I certainly wasn't right mapped out. I want to be a manager. I would have been quite happy to go to America and coach and live a really cushy lifestyle, but it didn't quite transpire like that, unfortunately. Would you advise young people who want to be managers to go and be a coach or an assistant manager first before yeah, you jump into management? 100%, yeah. And why? Just so you can learn off of these experiences? Yeah, guys? definitely. You know, if you look at Dermot O'Carroll, he's, he's a very bright boy, Dermot. Um, you know, he's now been assistant manager in League One with me in Morecambe, assistant manager here. Um, he's now been promoted up with Northern Ireland as first team coach. So he gets a vast experience. He meets a lot of people. He gets new ideas and he sees, he work, uh, Dermot works very, very closely with me. So he sees the problems. He sees what you have to deal with. When, when I was assistant to Mark, I genuinely thought I can do that job. It's easy, simple. You know what I mean? I, I see what Mark does. It's easy. Um, and then you realize that you only see about a third of it. Yeah. And when you go into the job, nobody wants to speak to the assistant manager. Everybody wants the manager. Everybody wants the manager's approval. They all want to see the manager. It's you they, they want to see at four o'clock. And I tell you, I learned a good thing off Mark McGee. He used to say, if you want to see me, come and see me after four o'clock in the afternoon. And nobody ever came to see him. See so Mark was like, come on, we'll go for a bottle of red wine up at West End. So <laughs> brilliant. But um, yeah, I think I think it's, it's difficult to go straight in. Um, a lot of players go in based on what they've done in their careers straight away as a footballer, but it certainly doesn't prepare you for the, the difficulties of management. You know, I could write a book in terms of some of the problems I've encountered um, with players, personal problems, um, really serious problems with mental health that nobody ever prepared you for all the pro licenses. Yeah. Um, half of it's a waste of time. I'd love to design a pro license based on, you know what, this is, this is, what's going to this is real life when you're yeah. a manager, this yeah. is what you have to deal with. And unfortunately about 90% of it is away from the football pitch and nothing prepares, probably nothing prepares you like it rather than the ex experience of the job, you know, but I, I use Dermot as an example. He's been with me all the time. I never speak to a player about a member of staff in the room because things get twisted. Um, and the, the aids that we live in, you've got to be extremely careful. Um, 
what what do you say and how you say it and you know i'm very conscious that you know you have to have somebody in the room so it's it's not a uv them sort of an opinion or an emotional decision it's a calculated conversation you know so i think that comes with experience and i think by being an assistant you you do learn that and you see a lot more than you would have you go directly into the job just on that mcgee never got naked or starved himself when you were there did you? <laughs> no, like you got, no, you no, yeah, there. no you got naked i i think a couple of times <laughs> I, 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 he never starved himself no he liked this <laughs> how did so how did the role at Mallow sort of come about being the assistant um but I, again probably a, a lucky one I would know Tommy Johnson very well former Celtic player um what a player striker wasn't he yeah Tommy yeah, yeah great lad Dollar. great player um currently living in Northern Ireland working there so Tommy was my assistant manager when Northern Ireland under 21s um and Ian Barraclough was manager of Motherwell and he came over to watch the session, which I was taking in Belfast and I got a phone call about two weeks later to say, look, do you want to be assistant manager of Motherwell? Didn't know Ian very well. Um, and um, yeah, jumped at the chance to go. Big decision because I had two young boys living in Northern Ireland at that time as well. So yeah, it was a it was a tough ask and sometimes you look back and think, you, you know, I probably missed my younger one growing up a lot as well. Puts a lot of strain on on relationships when you, you move away and travel and ultimately I, I ended up being divorced so um you look back and there's lots of things that are life defining and um that's probably where the whole thing started in terms of coming into the professional side of the game as well and then the first manager's job comes at Oldham is that right how did you find that transition <laughs> for assistant to manager? disaster oh, isn't it? absolute disaster yeah Why? Uh, well Oldham were a club that had sacked I think in nine managers before I'd went in four years um and in my wisdom I'd been away with a the European Championship Northern Ireland squad with Michael O'Neill. We'd gone to the last 16, thought we were brilliant. I thought I played a huge part in it. And I um, thought, yeah, I'm going to have a crack at this. Uh, Mark McGee told me not to do it. Michael O'Neill told me not to do it. And I didn't listen to anybody and thought, yeah, I'll go and do it. And Sean O'Driscoll was actually doing the recruitment for the manager at that time. And Sean had been one of my coaches at Bournemouth and got the phone call. And I um, thought, yeah, I'll do it. And I actually brought Ian Barraclough with me as my assistant. So we our roles were reversed. Um, I had to sign 17 players in three weeks. So you were getting players who hadn't, you know, been given a club. And it was, it was a ridiculous decision because at the time I thought I got a blank canvas. I can sign all the players that I want. I'm um, not realizing about budgets, not realizing how everything worked. And yeah, it was difficult. Um, I probably learned more about managing up the way in six months than I could have ever done in my life. Um, lots of things that I probably will never see again. Well, you know, I I'll give you one, you know, so we lost in the FA Cup and um, Oldham was a, a club where the, the, the chairman actually owned the stand, um, but not the, 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 he owned the stand and the players, but not the stadium, the rest of the stadium or the ground around it, something like that there. But we had food in one of the parts of the stadium and he banned us from having food. He said, right, because you, you didn't um, win the game, you're, you're not allowed to eat. So um, we weren't allowed to eat in the in the in one of the stands because it was his and the boys came in with lunch boxes the next day. I remember Charles Dunn was with me and he came in with Thomas the Tank Engine lunchbox <laughs> and some sandwiches. And I was just thinking, oh no. So yeah, there was, there was lots of things um, that you learn how to manage and approach a little bit differently, but certainly a learning curve. And probably I wouldn't have had the, ex ever, I say it was a, a mistake, but I probably wouldn't have, oh, cause Oldham could be a very, very good football club. Yeah. You know, fan base was fantastic. Um, but at that time it was, it was a wee bit, um, a wee bit messy. Uh, you took over at Motherwell 2017. Now we've got it on here. There was an old guard there at that time. How much, uh, how hard a task was it, sorry, to get a Scott McDonald, James McFadden, Steve McManus, and Stephen Pearson? Was that your decision, Sony? Yeah, put Keith Lasley into that, Keith. and um, <laughs> Stephen Dons. Hamill as well. Steve. Yeah, <laughs> so I came in, and they were legends at the club, you know, legends, Faddy, and, you know, people that had played at the top, top of the game. Um, Faddy was assistant manager, actually, um, because Mark had made him assistant manager, but Faddy hadn't made his mind up whether he wanted to continue playing and or coaching. So it was a real, real, real difficult time, but I just felt the whole place needed freshened up and it was a wee bit shitter bust, to be honest with you. I'm not allowed to say that in camera, I'm a but no, it was, uh, you know, so it, it was... In terms uh, of what shitter bust? Well, I was making a decision to get rid of seven legends, if, so to speak, very, very good players, really good boys as well. You know, I didn't really have a problem with any of them. Me and Scotty used to argue the bit out, but Scotty argued, Scotty with, argues Scotty argued with himself most of the time. It was like, <laughs> I could argue with Scotty, Scotty would be kicking doors down. And the next thing, it'd be my two boys talking away to them, the nicest boy in the world. And... Um, 
so yeah, me and Scotty had a love for hate relationship, a good boy, and probably now he's on the other side of the fence, he'll realise how hard it is. But um, yeah, I sat down with Alan Burroughs and I said, look, if, if you want me to run the football club and play the way I want to play, I need legs, I need energy. And, you know, we, we're going to have to get rid of the old guard. And there's some really difficult conversations, really difficult chats. I kept Keith with me. You know, I've seen real potential in Keith in terms of coaching and that transition between dressing room and, and me coming in kept that bond of, you know, a proper Motherwell outlook. And Steve McManus, I put to the under 18s and I put Stephen and Hamill in charge of the academy. So we kept an identity. The other boys was, it was really, really difficult conversations, you know, but, um, all as you expect from top pros took it very well. Um, you know, I'm sure Fatty's down to have a couple of digs at me in the press, but he doesn't, he's, he does he's, he does he does he probably does on the show. Yeah. I, <laughs> but you know, he's that, you know, that's a level of, of class, him and Stephen Pearson and boys that got hard at that time. But certainly it was, if I hadn't worked. Are you nervous for them? Yeah. Of course. Of you, like, even now, look, it's, it's not nice. I, I mean, telling the younger boys is harder than telling the older boys. You know, they've obviously got, a little bit of money behind them experience they're you know they're, they've obviously got all you know chances to move on with their careers but you telling young players is horrible it's the hardest thing in football you're breaking their careers and hurting their dreams and you know that's hard but yeah i i wouldn't say that i don't get nervous i've just probably become a little bit more immune to, or less immune to the emotions of it now but at the start yeah that was very very difficult you said faddy burst into tears when you told him he was crying uh, no him, i know. think it was sort of a mutual decision but i say faddy hadn't I don't know if he wanted to be assistant at that time. You know, Fatty was still playing at the time, still was very, very talented yeah. and hadn't made his mind up whether he wanted to go a coaching path or a media path or still continue to play. So it was it was probably a mutual decision in the end that I wanted to move forward. I found that I couldn't do all the coaching and the managing at the same time. It was, you know, it was, I was burnt out by the end of the time. We, we, I think he took over in March and we'd stayed up and I was like, I might not last too long in this management here. You know, I need yeah. to, and Keith was very much into his coaching, really into his coaching and as was Hammy and, and Steve McManus. That's I mean, it's incredible. You said that you, you, you keep them up that season, and then from there, just deal with two cup finals, finish third. What were the key factors in that? Was it getting uh, rid of Olgard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got rid of it. Remember now, all, all them players had been very, very successful at Motherwell, and before they had that relegation period, they were top six, they were finishing, you know, in the top three and four. So Motherwell had a real successful period under Stuart. Um, no, that was just a. I, I like to play with lots of pace and energy. Um, I thought we still had a balance. We we actually recruited, I think it was thirteen players that year. Um, again, Martin Foyle was was there and part of the recruitment. And you know, we were lucky that we we got to the two cup finals. So it, it gave me a little bit of um, so to speak money in the bank with the fans with the club. And then I was able to evolve the team. I was able to put a team together. Well, I think we finished eighth the next season, but we brought David Turnbull through, Jake Casey, Alan Campbell, Chris Carden had only played a, a handful of games. So we brought those boys through. That was a development year. And then we managed to, to finish third as well. So it, the first season was, was half a season where we, we stayed up. And that was just needs must. You played a style that suits you. We were able to recruit players with loads of pace and energy, big and physical, and probably my fault because I played up to it. I was like, yeah, we are physical, we are big, and that still stuck with me now. And I think, well, yeah. on Saturday, we had one player over six foot. We played not the Livingston game, sorry, the Aberdeen game. We were super, our, our build up play was excellent, but um, you still sort of get that reputation toward with you. But as I say, I played the what I could recruit. And over time, I was able to recruit better players at the top end of the pitch in terms of creativity. David Turnbull evolved and Alan Campbell came to the fore and we ended up playing a really nice style of football, 4-3-3 and, and finished third, which was fantastic. You know, it was... Um, Hasty was on fire that season as well. Was that, that season Jake That's Hasty Jake, I, Jake broke into the team. David yeah. broke into the team. I think David had 16, 17 goals. Jake had 11 goals. James Scott as well. You know, I forgot to mention. Hull, didn't he? James went to Hull for 1.8 yeah. million. Why Morecambe though? Because I'm getting yeah, no being disrespectful. I played down so I hated playing at Morecambe. Mate. <laughs> on a windy Tuesday night. With a wind just... blowing off the sea. Huh? I thought, I'd expected you uh, to get a... No, better than that because I don't want to be too disrespectful but maybe a, a team higher up the divisions but with Morecambe League 2 at the time no League 1 they got promoted right. um, Morecambe was a brilliant place a fantastic place to live and we, we had a great experience me and Robin moved down there Dermot moved down with his, his wife Anne as well and we loved living down there we loved the people that we had a lovely house right near the sea the club was a club that had got promoted from the conference but had, had a conference structure the no League 1 structure yeah. um, and, and listen the chairman Rob and all the people down there were very very good with us but it was a real challenge again they only had three signed players um, again I probably didn't do my homework the way I should have done and I'd been out of work probably six months I turned down a job in Scotland 
I turned down another job in England um, and I was probably starting to get a bit itchy feet. You know, I've not made fortunes in life, I can assure you of that. And I need to work. You know, you're Bentley in the car park? No, are you are joking? That's Marco Harris Bentley in the head. <laughs> <laughs> he's son of Robbo, so he's all right. That's why he's got that on. But um, yeah, look, it was a decision. I thought they'd just come up. There was a, a feel good factor around the town. And, and we enjoyed our time there. We, you know, we, we ended up, we played a lot of good football. It was, it was fantastic to watch. We lost a lot of games and it was exciting, but we had a brand of football that was was completely different than what we were doing. Um, and we were trying to build something there. And so Mern came, you know, people don't believe me. I hear people go, ah, it was planned for weeks and months. And it wasn't, I got a phone call completely out of the blue. Um, actually from Keith at the time, he phoned me to say, listen, I've, I've spoke to Jim Gillespie, the vice chairman. Um, he really wants to speak to you. He wants the he wants you to come to St. Mirren. I was like, well, right, he needs to speak to me, agent. Then um, I'm happy where I am, you know. So, but it, it moved that quickly, and we, you know, we ended up they agreed a fee for me, and it was a heavy heart. I left, you know. I, I don't like things like that. I'm I'm quite straight up. I try and you know do things properly, but it was an opportunity to come back up to Scotland with a, a team that I felt could move forward and and I also felt that with what I knew was happening with the training ground and the infrastructure of the football club that we could move forward and then I got here and realised there were £1.6 million in debt yeah. and um, <laughs> I was like, Jesus, what did I do? <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's was turned Was Big Kev in at Morecambe? No, he'd left. left he'd, 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 left, so I, he, he'd left, no, I think like Kev, Kev was a popular boy down there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's time to go into the playing career. Where did you come through as a kid? That'll be short then. <laughs> no, we go for that quite quickly then, yeah. yeah. Much better than what we thought it was. <laughs> Some of the names is unreal. Uh, I played with a lot of good players. I wasn't very good, like, but I played with a lot of good players. Uh, <laughs> Where did you come through it, mate? Spurs. So I started my career at Spurs. Um, played, uh, played two games in the Premier League and then they found me out. So um, still told me two games still in the Premier League. Aye, it was... Um, it was in that Spurs side. So it was um, Nick Barnby, um, Darren Anderton, wow. Steve Sedgley, um, David Halls, and then it was the famous five after that. So it was Klinsman, uh, was, it, was it Dimitrescu? I can't remember the one, Nick Barnby, um, who was a good friend of mine, Teddy Sheringham. Wow. So it was um, it was a lot of good people. Gaza was there when I first went. He came back injured after the World it? Cup and I'd done my back. So we rehabbed <laughs> together, which was fantastic. We're going to come to him, but just, sorry, uh, just, just on that, before you went to Spurs, is that true that... Get him soon as what Jet Rangers and said Alex Ferguson what Jet Man you're is that? Aye, no, no, it's true. Aye, 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 aye. No, no, it's true, it's true. Um Graham Soonis was on the phone to my brother in law who was a mad Rangers fan. Um, so you've got a phone call for Graham Soonis at the boy? Yeah, so it was he phoned my dad at the time because I was only 14, so in them days you could sign schoolboy forms for, so that in Scotland they could offer a six year contract, so it was like you're getting a six year contract at 14. Um, so he would phone my dad and my, my brother in law who's a mad Rangers fan, he was in there. Um, and then we were over at Man United with Alex Ferguson as well. So I used to be actually quite good when I was about 14. I don't know what happened between between 18 and 22. It all went wrong somewhere. Like, yeah, same, but yeah. Um, yeah, the choice of it. But again, I was quite loyal. I'd been going to Spurs from I was 11. Um, and I had a loyalty to Robbie Walker, who was the, the chief scout in Northern Ireland. And had a real relationship with him. So, you know, I just felt that it was the right thing to do. So I, you never know where my life or career would have went if it had done it the other way around. But I oh, know yeah. I don't have any regrets on that. Is Terry he? Venables, your Spurs manager. Mm. Was Terry Venables? Was yeah. It? So it was, it was Terry that signed me, um, and I played under Ozzy Ardiles. So it was, uh, it was your experience in top top managers. Yeah. He, he was was he a top top manager? He was top class. Now I was I was a kid at the time. I was only young. Um, I'd only I was going across 14, 15, 16. Um, so that's when you were seeing Terry Venables. But I mean, some of his detail. That was the the first sort of little in when I look back at it I wasn't taking it in at that age obviously but he didn't say too much after games you know I remember players telling me he didn't rant and rave after games it was non-emotional he waited until a Monday morning whereas emotions were calm and he didn't say anything he'd regret so I remembered that and thought yeah that's that's probably the way to go I didn't do that early in my no, life career, by the way. <laughs> but uh, I've learned since you can't take back what you say so be very careful what comes out of your mouth yeah. you love Venables didn't you? Oh, yeah he's, he's top class he was, yeah. you know, he's top, to top, uh, uh, yeah. top top class in terms of football knowledge and as a guy as well yeah, yeah. Wait, see at 15 did you get a right serious injury that he might have doctors might have said you're not going to be able to play again yeah my back so I was told so I had an injury I went past the goalkeeper pulled my leg and I had, see my sciatic nerve went so I needed an operation on it so they told me look you'll probably not play football again they wanted to fuse my spine and all so I had an operation where it wasn't fused and I managed to play I managed to play until I was about 22 again, had another operation and then had another one at Preston. So I'm, I've had three and about 15 epidurals, but um, it hasn't stopped me running anyway. So is, that age, though, how, is that mentally really, really tough though? 
I probably didn't realise the Don't consequences it, yeah. of it. You know, you're like when you're 15, you think, I'm invincible. That's, you know, you're not really half listening to the specialists when they tell oh, you. Yeah. But um, it was a, a specialist, Mr. Adair in Belfast. They recommend, Spurs recommended he done the operation. Um, he was the best in the UK, so he did. And he, he done fantastically well, well for me and be forever grateful for him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, you mentioned the McKenna. Go yeah. to ask you about guys. Any interactions? One funny. Loads, yeah. I was, I was very, very lucky. Um, very lucky, yeah. As I lived with Paul Moran, who played for Spurs as well. So I lived with Paul and his, his mum, Eileen, God rest her soul, she passed away recently. Um, he looked after me like a mum at times as well. Um, but I used to, I had a A Reg Blue Astra. I used to drive in and you've got guys on about 50 grand a, a week at that time. Paul Moran, first team player as well. I used to drive the both of them in and I know the spots all over my face, covered in acne and they used to drive in my buckets over their head. So I did. Uh, remember, <laughs> remember the Oxy 10 advert where they used to have the buckets over your head? So, the, the drive-in wouldn't speak a word and you could let the two of them shake him with laughter. So, yeah, I'd done, a, I'd done all my, my rehab with Gaza. He had come back from the World Cup with his knee and I'd, I'd had that back operation. So, I was just 15 turned 16. Um, and the managed to spend a lot of time with him, which was very interesting. And, and actually, years later... Um, we were playing a friendly game. I, I think uh, I think I was at Bournemouth or Luton. But years, years later, he um, he came into the dressing room. He was playing an exhibition game. I think it was Buxton or Burton. He was playing for at the time. I think he played one game, and he come in to the dressing room, knocked the door, and he said, "Where is he? The wee man? Where is he?" And he come in. He went, "Hi, are you?" Like shoot, shoot oh, and I was like, brilliant. So as he walked out, he went, "Listen, some of us have played with good players, lads. <laughs> you know, I, th I couldn't believe he remembered me, but that shows Amazing. the level of the guy and and what he is. You know, he's he was a top top boy. Looked after all the young boys." He used to run. Did you, did you just go with him? Um, he didn't need to. He, he probably um, was having nights out and parties in the club. So he was, he was brilliant with the young boys. You know, he paid for everything. If we were if we were going out as a as a youth team, he was he was paying for us. He was throwing fifty pound notes and twenty pound notes at you. Oh, yeah. Bearing in mind, we were in twenty nine fifty at the time. So him throwing a twenty pound note in the car park for us to scramble for was was good fun. But no, he's great fun. Really, really yeah. good fun. But. Uh, like, I mean, out of this world as a footballer. Did you train him then? Yeah, when he was, he'd done, he'd done all his rehab, came back and, you know, trained with him and say that the players that were there at the time, um, ne um, Naheem, if you remember him. Yeah, he's good for the half uh, against Arsenal. Fantastic. Brilliant. And, you know, he was, he was probably one of the most talented players I've ever seen. Underrated, so underrated. Um, so you were, you're constantly in the round top, top footballers. Lineker yeah. as well. Hi guys, Lineker as well. He was just there. Um, I remember him hiding in the woods. He told that story the other week when he was on a pre-season run. I think it was my first pre-season with him where he hid in the woods and the second lap he joined back in okay. again. So that was experience for you. Yeah, he, had, he was just leaving after when I'd signed. So I think he was only there a couple of months before he left. Amazing. We need the debut story. Aye. Right, but I, can, I, can you go to a second? I just want to ask, were you gutted when Terry Venables leaves though? Well, they replaced him with Ozzy Ardiles. So, so um, there, actually, it was it was Doug Liver. I think it was Doug Livermore and um, Ray Clements, first of all, um, who came in, and then Ozzy. I think I got that the right way around. But it was Ozzy giving me my debut. So um, I probably would have worked more with Ozzy because I was training regular with the first team at that stage. So it was only. Did 17. he join it? Ozzy didn't give the ball away for. I think it was about. 12 weeks he was I don't think he'd give the ball away in the boxes and he hated to see anybody run he couldn't watch pre-season running so after he'd done five asides he was like right I'm going in Go I can't watch that anymore so he just wanted total soccer total uh, football, yeah total football and it was good luck with the two centre halves because everybody else he didn't he didn't allow the centre forwards to press you weren't allowed to you know save your energy so it was um, <laughs> it, it, it actually kill, it killed my whole game because I could only run, run uh, I had no talent I just needed to run so that was me out of spurs very quickly unfortunately talk us through the debut then Look, they're always fascinated to hear us. How, did you know the day before? Uh, no, knew nothing about it. Um, what age were you, sorry? I was 17, I was 17. Just 17. In the Premier League? Yeah, against Blackburn. Um, Home and away, sorry. Away to Blackburn. So they won the league that year, Blackburn. So wow. it was uh, the Sutton and Shearer, uh, Mike Newell, um, Colin Jason Hendry. Fox, uh -huh. uh, so it was, it, it was, was Kenny was manager, was he? Was yeah, yeah, Kenny Douglas. Um, no, I didn't. I scored two in the reserves against Arsenal. Um, Travelled up. And it was me and Nick Barnby. Aussie announced the team just before the kickoff, and I had no inkling it was coming. Um, and David Barry, who mom, strangely enough, my mum and dad knew his mum and dad through. We went caravanning and camping together, and um, and that's how my mum and dad found out because David Barry had told his dad, who had told my mum and dad that we were playing. You know, so it was, it was at Blackburn. Obviously, he was at Blackburn yeah. at that stage as well. So um, yeah, and I think I got man of the match. It was I don't know how because Eric Thorsfeld got a nine in the newspaper. It was it was you know they. 
demoralised us. They just battered us for, for 90 minutes. But it was uh, certainly an experience. Uh, so you got man of the match on your Premier League, did you? I think because everybody else was that bad and I was the youngest one on the pitch. It wasn't through anything I'd done, I don't think. But did that realise that he mentioned you after the team talk? Yeah, no, it was it. brilliant. It was a brilliant way to manage a young boy making his debut, you know, because had I had time to think about it, I probably had him used that much nervous energy. And I had Steve Sedgley, who was the joker of the group as well. So he was... Um, he was giving me some before. You were thinking you'd get sympathy. And he's, you better be good, by the way. Yeah. So I was under pressure straight away. But no, the, the boys were brilliant with you when you were making your debut, you know, arm around you. Um, it's a, a superb experience. Do you think the boys here know about your playing career? Because I, I tell them all the time. In, I, I, my two games every week. <laughs> <laughs> do you drop in big No, are you joking? They, they, they know nothing about it. No, they, they think I'm some old man, which are not far wrong to be. Uh -huh. Was Saul Campbell there at that time? Saul was my age group. Me and Saul played in the same youth team. Wow. Uh, Oh, brilliant. Saul was um, Saul was centre for me and Saul played up front together. Joe. Saul and I, we played in the, the South East Counties up front together. Um, it's funny, it was probably only me and Saul. Darren Kasky was the year above with Nick Barnby. So we were probably the only two out of that age group who actually had a, a prolonged career in football, you know, when you consider how many good players it was in that youth team. Uh -huh. so. See, we spoke about off-camera about young players now, they're really quiet. How were, how were the young players back then and how did the older players take that? Oh, gobby. Why is that? How would <laughs> yeah. you give them that? Everybody was, you know, you didn't know your place in them days. You, yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, I think society's changed, doesn't it? You know, players don't speak. They walk about with their headphones on. You wouldn't, uh, we didn't have headphones in those days anyway. So mobile phones weren't, um, I don't think there was too many iPhones floating about in them days when yeah. I was an apprentice. But what about um, like mistakes now in training? Would they, would they get, would they get on you? Oh, uh, I think you, you got away with nothing. You know, the standards and demands were, were incredible. Um, and you took it, you accepted it because that was, how you were brought up and I had a guy Patsy Holland who was my youth team manager um, you know Patsy was was excellent but told you the truth you got told where nowadays young players don't hear the truth from anybody bar probably me you know their mums and dads tell them they're the best thing around their agents tell them the best thing around so they get them um, the youth managers don't want to upset them for fear of saying the wrong thing and they get the first team level and the first time you criticise them they can't deal with it they can't take it and um, there's lots in society has changed for the better but there's also lots of bits I'd love to have taken with me because um, they, they find it difficult to, to take constructive criticism nowadays yeah. big fan of you who you love Alan Sugar was he, did you have any interactions with him he was owner at the time was he not uh, he, was, he was in charge of the time no no I didn't never even uh, seen him know, I wasn't, I wasn't um, on his radar at that stage no, <laughs> no. and then for, see, for, for, for you taught him do you go to Bournemouth then I went to Bournemouth yeah under Mel Machen um, I was there for seven years Brilliant time. Absolutely what brilliant a place, time. mate, Bournemouth. Yeah, it was like abroad. It was oh like, it was like Marbella. I think I signed for Marbella. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. Um, we had a group of boys. We were bottom of the league at the time and Mel Machen signed a group of boys. Matty Holland, um, Ian Cox. Who else was there down there? Steve Jones, West Ham player, Scott Mean. Um, who else was Jamie Vincent? Boys that all had a, like, Vincent, yeah, yeah, really yeah. good, really good career. Russell Beardsmore, little Beardo, big Steve Fletcher. Um, he's a legend in uh, the right? he's, he's a legend, he's a legend in his own uh, his own <laughs> mind. Uh, but um we had a great we had a great um bunch of boys and we lived life to the full. We enjoyed ourselves and we went out and we kept the club up that year. It was called the first great escape. There was a second one under Eddie as well. Um and we enjoyed our time, we had a real good time under Mel. How was Eddie? How was a football player? By um, average. <laughs> by average, I can tell by Eddie was work. okay. No, no, Eddie was okay. Eddie was, Eddie was, Eddie was only a young boy when I was there. Um it's um he was quiet and he was always very very quiet well educated um good football he had injury problems Eddie had a lot of injury problems with his knee when he signed for Portsmouth and, and struggled a little bit um but I was he was still making his way in the first team he played at Wembley with us we played in the the auto windscreens funny I seen it in the, the this is Newcastle thing he was I seen the footage of it it's actually my man that scored the golden goal Wayne was Burnett that I, think it, I think it was Wayne Burnett that scored the winner so um yeah but no at, at that stage I certainly didn't see Eddie going on to do how well he's done in a management role because he was he was quiet um, obviously young but always always a thinker about the game and, and obviously took a lot of information in as well Have you been to uh, see him? I haven't no no I, I would still speak to him and you know ask for a few favours and, and, and some opinions on players um, and he's always brilliant always comes back to me and delighted to see his success Is there any other managers you've been in to watch? Um, or do you speak to regularly? Sean Dyson used to go into to Burnley and, and see Sean a lot um, 
unfortunately you don't get loads of time to do it you know it's um it's so full on actually getting the time down to see people and, and get in amongst it is, is very very difficult and that was a good thing about international football you were able to go all around the world and see different tactics and and how different people do things so it's uh my that's the one bit of it i miss but i took a lot from sean deitch and i try and listen to a lot of the the podcasts on the uh the the high performance. Uh, yeah, but you're always watching. Really you're always listening to open goal as well. So, you said yeah. that's probably oh, yeah. you're saying the wrong thing. Hundred percent. Yeah. You learn that high press on open so, goal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So see if Pep came as a man, drink he would change and drink. He'd play for higher up the pitch. Um, I thought it was funny. I went to you say about learning, and I, I went to. Uh, a night with Jurgen Klopp, so it was through the LMA, there was wow. only 50 managers there, and it was fantastic listening to him, I said Jurgen Klopp with Pep, there was one with Jurgen as well, which I missed, um, but it was with Pep, and it was fantastic to see how grounded he was, and he more or less said, look, I have the same problems as you, with egos, and, and the captain, and dropping players, and, and the style of football, and more or less he said, look, I had to change when I went to Baron. I had different players. I couldn't play total football. I had Lewandowski in, in, the, in the middle of it. I had, um, was it Robin out wide? And he said, I adapted where I put lots more crosses into the box because you, before he didn't, he constantly went around yeah, and looked yeah. for gaps. Yeah. So he adapted to world-class players to suit what he had in the building. So he was he agreed fully and he paid a lot of admiration to people working at lower levels in, in terms of the, the difficulties he faced. But ultimately you might be getting paid more money, but you still face the same difficulties as a yeah. manager. Just on David Moyes, were you there with Dave Lucas now? I was, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I was there, there I was Luke, with, yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll not talk about what he's got in there, but... Uh, <laughs> he said that when Moyes came into Preston, he just completely changed the football club, um, David Moyes. Yeah. Would, would you go along with it? Yeah, Moyes, he signed me... Um, and he, he literally had the club by the scruff of the neck and dragged it up. You know, it was a club that he'd got promoted um, from League One to the Championship. But they'd, they'd been a club that sort of underachieved and he put structures in place. And I, as you say, learning from managers, I've, I've tried to go into every football club and leave them in a place that's better than what I inherited from both Motherwell and Morecambe and, and St. Merlin. And he was probably the first I'd seen that. You know, he wanted his hands on everything, you know, from the youth team, development squad, what they ate, how they prepared. And to the extent Moisey actually took the warm-up, you know, and even when he went to Everton, he was still doing that. He was still taking warm-ups and that. And I think he's he's realised now, you know, Jimmy Lumsden, who was with him, Lummy used to say, you know, you've got to let other people do stuff. So um, he's probably evolved that as well. But he was, he was hands-on and, you know, you could never question him because... He was so into it and his drive and his work ethic was unquestionable as well as his detail and his energy, you know. So and his motto was like, I'm, I know where I'm going. Who wants to come with me? Yeah. And and he dragged players with him. He dragged the football club with him. So yeah, it was it was interesting to see. Yeah. Have you seen him go proper off his nut? Oh, aye, yeah. Aye, yeah. I was in the squad when we were away, so when all of the headlines came out what was that? <laughs> so, on the pre-season trip. So yeah, I've seen it. I've well, seen what it. you've got caught going it? Uh, I, oh, we didn't get caught. We're all going out. No, Moisey let the boys go out, but um, yeah, Moisey had Moisey knew when to when to lose his temper and and when not to. So ah, he's Scottish, isn't he? So yeah, yeah. You know yeah. What I mean, <laughs> have you got that to say to you? Have I? Um, I think I did. Very early on, as I say, I probably searched for confrontation. Um, I was mad on the touchlines. I played every game. I kicked every ball. I still do, but I don't get involved with fourth officials. I, don't, I try not to even speak to them now because they, they end up influencing your thoughts and you're not concentrating. I don't really argue with the opposition managers anymore again. But um, yeah, it's few and far between that I go for players now because again, I think society's evolved. I don't think players... In my day, you got shouted at and it was forgotten. You came in Monday morning where no, it's not. They're, they're a little bit more, um, softer. They need explanations. They need it backed up by video footage. They need, and again, go back to Terry Venables. Actually, when you say something emotionally, and I've done it, you know, quite a few times early on, you can't take it back and then yeah. you lose the player. And, and what you realize is they didn't mean to do that. So can I take it away and be constructive about it now? Come in on a Monday morning and go, look, this is what you did. This is how I think I can make it better. Um, and I try to generalize things a little bit more than be personal with people because I look back and, you know, you mentioned Luton joking here. When, when you go for an individual, your natural reaction is you'll come back and defend yourself. And it ends up being a, uh, a shout and match at each other which nobody gains and probably the only person that actually feels bad about it is you in the end so yeah. uh, that comes with a, a wee bit more knowledge and experience but uh, there's the odd occasion that I do still as well yeah we had a wee peek into your office there before we came in and I read the Guardiola poster it's up on your wall the, 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 about running yeah 
Uh, and it was leading to the question of what, what's the one thing that a Stephen Robinson player must have? They have to run. They have to be able to run because they're all talented. Um, you know, I, I think we get good boys into the building, but you have to be able to run. Football nowadays is so athletic, it's so intense, um, and you have to be able to cover distance and you have to be able to run at a high speed. You know, so if my scout, Martin Fort scout, <laughs> singular, if he gives me a boy that can run, then I'm confident enough in my staff that we can get them better positionally. You know, if they can't run, you can't make them quicker. Yeah. That's unfortunate. It's uh, you can't. I remember Arsene Wenger saying it. You know, you can turn athletes into players, but it's hard to turn players into athletes. Yeah. So it's it's something that stuck with me. Obviously, if you've got somebody who's multi talented and they're not the quickest person in the world, then that they have a ten out of ten attribute. But um, being able to run is a is a big part of it. And if if you look at Guardiola's quote, he thinks the same. Yeah, brilliant. So, you spoke about Joe Kinnear there. How did you go on with him? Uh, brilliant. Brilliant. Joe was a character. Um, <laughs> I've got a funny story. Joe signed me. Um, and he, so he signed me, but he had never seen me play. I know he had never seen me play. So Matty Spring was a boy. He was, he was at Luton for a long time. Matty was meant to sign for Charlton. Mick Harford would have done a lot of the recruitment. So big Mick had obviously pushed Joe into signing me. I signed for, from um, Preston. Went down there. Played the first game, first couple of games pre-season, played the first game and got taken off at half-time. Me and Robbie Winters got taken off, dragged off at half-time. Joe called me into the office. I played right wing. I was like, what am I doing playing right wing? So Matty Spring didn't go. Big Mick Harford had told Joe that I was a right winger. I only found this out when I went into the office. So dragged into the office. He said, right, what's the matter with you? He said, you know, when was the last time you went past a player? And I said, well, probably when I was about 10. You know, I've never played right wing for 10 years. And he looked around at Big Mick Harford and Big Mick was chuckling and got there. He went, you told me he was a winger, Mick. So I seen Joe about five years later and I walked into the restaurant and he shouted over at me, there's a fucking winger as I come in, you know. So that was Big Joe. So I don't think Joe had seen me play. Um, he had, I mean, he was brilliant. He didn't come to the training ground, Joe. He would let Mick take what, it. What, the week you never came? He wouldn't, wouldn't see Joe. Joe would, Joe would be doing things at the ground. We'd be at the training ground. He'd come up. He'd come up. When I remember he came up, we, I think we'd lost the first two games. He came up. We had Daley Thompson taking us for a pre-season. No wonder we lost the first six <laughs> games. Thompson. I was brilliant at 400 metres, to be fair. <laughs> Daley he, Thompson. Uh, he'd come up and he said, if I could, he pulled us all together. We'd not seen him for two weeks. And he said, if I could replace all 11 of you, I would. And that was our team talk before the game on the Saturday before we won. So maybe that's what I'm doing wrong but Joe, Joe was a character and was the newest stuff you know was very very knowledgeable yeah. him and Big Mick together were Big you know, still there isn't he? Big like? Mick's still there yeah and he, he had health problems and he's, he's doing great now so delighted to see their success and, and Mick getting involved in that as well I'm going to say to them they're not going to win a game in that Premier League mate <laughs> no I'm convinced they're zero points this year nah, they, they will they will they will they'll win the career win, needs to get that, that job again they need to get career back nah, in nah, they'll, they'll, Big Joe will get them going anyway <laughs> they'll win games at the county they will 100% uh, playing out of position is the worst as a football player. Right? The what? When you're playing out of position. Oh, oh well, I was then, because I, I was I was poor in my own position. Never mind anybody else's position. So would you have been the type that would go see him yourself and say, "Listen, no, I wouldn't went anywhere." Never. Would you have never went to a manager's door now? Uh, no. I remember going to Mel Machen early on when I thought I was a really good player signing for Spurs, and Mel was watching the racing in the background. So he had the TV up there, and I was Mel. He was well, while you were talking, while to I was talking to him, and he just went, "You went out of the room thinking you're the best player in the world anyway." So Mel was worrying about his his bet at Cheltenham, and um, you were like, "I'm wasting my time. There's no point." So no, I wasn't really one to. I just got on with it, and you just, you know, I, I think you can't really change anything in the office you can only change things on the pitch and you just get down and knuckle hard and knuckle down and, and work hard and see if you can change it so you know, does always, it still happen now do players still chat managers oh does? I 100% they do I, but I've brought the Mark McGee one in where come and see me after four <laughs> none of them are here so it's brilliant <laughs> but no they do yeah there's I I um, I do try and give explanations for why they're not playing if I don't I say look maybe it's just a, a decision I've made um, we watch maybe five games of the opposition you watch two minutes of them yeah. so there's reasons why we, we pick teams and, and make changes so th this is a great gr group of boys you know it's probably the best group of boys I've had they accept decisions and the only way they put it right is to, to run harder and work harder and, and play better on the pitch and that's that's easy manage this squad's an easy squad to manage is that the hardest part leaving people out on a Saturday the hardest bit's picking 11 players yeah. when you've got a squad this good and and so dedicated and nobody tosses training off actually naming the squad and seeing the disappointment 
and you've been there as players yourselves, you know when you go home, you're telling your missus, you're telling your mum and dad, and they're like, well, you know, you're the best player here, and we can't believe he's doing that, and he's treating you badly, he's only taking you off, and let's be fair, they've all done it to us, haven't they? And yeah. my ex-wife is still telling me, our oh, Harry should be playing here, and he's the best player in the world, and, you know, we, we all do it, and as parents, you know, you, you only see the the good things in them as well. So it's difficult. It's difficult to disappoint people who you've real real time and emotions for. Sorry to keep going back to this, but I love this. Who was the scariest manager you had? Um, <laughs> probably Joe. Probably Big <laughs> Joe. Um, yeah, Joe scared the life out of me because he didn't know what he was going to say next. Could and he was, or lose the plot? Yeah, he could, but it was funny. Like, see if it wasn't you, it was brilliant. <laughs> I remember he used to go for Adrian Forbes. Like, he used to hammer Forbes. He, he was, I think Forbes is at Norwich now, doing really well on the coaching side of things. And um, he used to give Forbes some stick. And I'd only just come into the club, and I was like, "Wow, Tony Thorpe, Thorpe, he was there as well, you know." So we had a squad of players that Big Joe signed me and Thorpe, and I think he took Thorpe off at half time as well that day, and. Um, yeah, I missed a chance at Cardiff. I mean, I don't know how I missed it. And he came in and he he run into the change room and he, he came in and I thought, oh, I was devastated anyway for missing the chance. And he said, I could have put that in my max fucking cock. He's like, oh, Joe, you'll never play for me again. And out he went again, you know. So that was how you used to be able to talk to players, yeah, that unfortunately. Was that, was, uh, that was an norm yeah, back then. Yeah, and then he, 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 he started me the week after, so that was how it was. That was a norm. So I uh, you know Joe scared the life out of me. He scared the life out of everybody. The scariest person was Mick, because Big Mick didn't say anything. He's and, maybe hard as nails. Yeah, and if Mick spoke, you listened. He didn't say much. And um, you knew he'd, you knew if he did say something, you were in big trouble. So um, nobody ever... No, Mick had the management job. Nobody knocked a Mick's door that's for certain yeah, I can imagine. Sure, yeah. Mike Newell as well mate you played your best football under Mike Newell and have you said that in the past? Yeah Newell was Newell got, got the best, out, best out, 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 out we just had a we had a brilliant squad I put with big Stevie Hard who went on the Leeds and, and Leicester you know, Stevie Hard? Big Stevie was there yeah Viney, Rome Vine <laughs> we had uh, we had Amma <laughs> Berk, Amma Berkovich, Kevin Nichols you played the best of it? Ah we Berko I so um we had he's a really a good squad man, of players, huh? brilliant eye, brilliant. But we had we had a group of boys and it was like he brought, I think newly brought all the misfits together, you know, it was like a group of misfits together who had failed at other clubs and had gone depressed and hadn't really worked out and Nick's had been, Nick had been at Charlton, um, Big Stevie I think was at Northampton, had a bad season before it. Um, and then he just, everything clicked for us, you know, newly knew how to manage us as a group and he, he let us do what we wanted really, you know, just, we, we really done what we wanted and produced the goods for him on a Saturday and it was great times, you know, we won League One, got into the championship, we were top of the championship of flying and then all of a sudden we sold, I think we sold Viney to QPR, Big Stevie went to Leeds, we had Nico went to Leeds and it was only me and Big Marlon Beresford, the goalkeeper left with any kind of experience and we are like, oh no, we used to go out every week and think, how are we going to win? And we just kept winning. We just kept winning the game after game. We won League One with record points at the time uh, and in the championship, you know, so. Well, just great purely times. on team spirit, like? Well, it was a talented group of boys. And, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing newly a, a disservice there in terms of what he created at the football club as well. You know, he, he allowed us, him and Branstein, Steen, he was, was assistant manager. I know they were, they just knew how to treat boys. We had a good group of players, talented boys, and he allowed people to express themselves, you know, and in itself, that's, you know, top class managers yeah. being able to go and express yourself and, um, within the structure. I just done everybody else's running, like, uh, yeah. me and Nico just done everybody else's running. The rest of the team were very good around us. So, um, but it was good, good times, good, uh, good memories of the was club. Was Vine, was he? He's, I, I know Rowan really, Vine, Vine, Vine was probably the most normal out of that group. <laughs> so oh, that's, wow. that tells you, you know, I, 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 I knew you were going to ask me, but Vinny, Vinny was probably one of the most normal people out of that group. So that? we had Nico and um, Saul Davis. Saul, Saul was the guy who, he had the stroke on the bus. You remember, he had a stroke. We were, we was playing cards with Newley. And the next thing, he, he had the stroke on the way to the game. Um, you know, and he's, he managed to survive and get back playing again and all that as well. But Saul was, Saul was crazy. Nick's was crazy. Um, we Burko. Um, so I, Vinny was one of the most normal ones. Yeah. I was the moody one. I just... Went home every day, moody, and moaned at everybody. So, yeah. aye. Vine was a good player, wasn't he? He was excellent. Yeah, Vine. He was it, we, him and him and um, Stevie, big Stevie up front, Howard. were unplayable. You know, at times, and we had Warren Feeney in the background as well. Feeney coming on as well. So, a really good squad of players. Paul Underwood, you know. So, and then we had um, Leon Barnett came through. Um, Curtis Davies came through as well. So Kevin Foley. Yeah. So produced a lot of good players around about that time, and just married with a. A group of Asbos <laughs> married with really good young players. It, it seemed to work, you know. Uh -huh. uh, and then, oh, no, aspirations, mate. 
So where do you, I, is, we love this one, as a manager, where do you want to get to? It's not want to manage at the very top. I want to manage at the very top of the game. You know, I've I've got a lot of belief in my ability. I've managed to be lucky to surround myself with really, really good people throughout my career. You know, I've got a fantastic coach in Dermot O'Carroll now who'll one day be a top-class manager. So why not? You know, aim for the stars. You might land on the moon. I don't know. You know, it's it's just about opportunities. Um, and, you know, what's what's the pinnacle of your career managing your country? You know, it's it's something that, you could never ever turn down if it, if it came your way. Um, You've what, been linked to it a few times, haven't you? Yeah, it was, I've been linked with every job in Scotland, so, every job uh, in England, and, and the reality is I've never spoke to a single club. You know, I've never put myself forward to a club, and a lot of it's you know it, it actually gets annoying in the end because you think, look, it's it's actually wrong because you're at a football club and you get asked about things last week. And you're like, well, I've not spoken to anybody. I'm totally focused on doing the job here, and I think I conduct myself like that. If if you do the job right. At clubs, you know, people notice you and if they think you're good enough to go to a higher level and work at the top echelons of the game, then they'll do it. And, you know, it's the same at international level. Um, I interviewed once for it. Um, when and, was that? After? It, it was after Michael. Right. It was after Michael. Yeah, and Ian Barraclough got the job. So, you know, another good person got the job. You're, you're going against very good people. So, one of those things... I went with Motherwell's, you know, blessing. You know, they they allowed me to go, and I would never go while I was at a club and talk to another club because I just think if you don't get the job, you come back and you know you're well, you're second best. Then you know they either want you or they don't want you. You know your CV and your your interviews on the pitch. That's that's where you do your talking with your teams and, yeah. and how you produce and and what you've done in terms of building a football club. So you never know. Um, I'm very very happy where I am. You know, I feel we're building something really successful here as well, and. You know, if, if the opportunity arises, then it has to be the right opportunity, and it's it's obviously something you you look at, as you say, to to take your career forward at times. Ah, your favourite meal, the electric chair comes in. It's your last day on earth. Your last meal, would you go for? Start a main dessert. Oh, it would have to be a main. No, you can have a starter. I mean, oh, a starter, and a starter, and main, oh, and dessert. Oh, oh, that's decent. It'd be funny. Me and my missus were talking about this the other day. She asked me the same question. We never done the starters or the desserts to be Just fair. Straight to main. It was a, it was the main meal. Um, I'd have to go for some sort of prawns to start with. Prawns, pill, pill. Oh, nice. Go for the spin. That would be my wee starter. Nice wee bit of for cats here bread to dip into it. Um, Pizza, I love pizza. It's boring, pizza. isn't it? It's oh, really pizza boring. Pizza is amazing. Yeah, could, have a, could have a pizza with a wee bit of steak on it. Of course you can. I'll fill fillet steak from the top. Um, <laughs> dessert. Oh, any kind of rubbish. I've got a sweet tooth. Get there, a big bar of dairy milk. I'm not oh. going to dessert. I'm going chocolate to finish it off. That's it. Good night. God bless. That's me. Tremendous. <laughs> Stephen <laughs> Robinson, right what a guy. Cheers, man. Thank Thanks, you. Mate. Cheers, Cheers, boy. Thank, Thank you. you.